of a single limiting factor, say labor hours is limited, then you have to calculate the contribution per labor hour and then rank the products. Product with the first rank should be produced first. That is how you increase the profitability whenever there is a single limiting factor. Now, if it is a machine hours that is limited, then basically you have to calculate the contribution per machine hour. And if it's a raw materials in kg which is limited, then you have to calculate the contribution per kg and then rank the products. And it is then you decide which product is to be produced first. Now, with this information, let's tackle the next question. The amount is given in dollar. So, we have got three services. So, it's equivalent to three products, R, S and T. And the fees charged is $100 for R, $150 for S and $160 for T. So, this is nothing but the selling price. And then direct material cost given, direct labor cost given, variable overheads given, fixed overheads is also given. Direct labor is paid at the rate of $1.25 per hour. What are the most and the least profitable uses of the direct labor which is a scarce resource? So, they have specifically said that direct labor is a scarce resource, which means that this is a case of single limiting factor. How do we establish which is the most profitable product? We have to calculate contribution per labor hour because direct labor is limited. So, first we have to calculate contribution and contribution is equal to sales minus the variable cost. Now, there are three variable costs here. So, we will total those. So, it is 50 for R, 85 for S and $77 for service T. Now, it is easy to find out the contribution. For service R, it is 100 minus 50. The contribution is $50. For service S, it is 150 minus 85 or $65. And for service T, it is 160 minus 77 or $83. What is our intention? We have to calculate the contribution per labor hour. For that, we should know how many labor hours are required for each product. Now, look at this row very carefully. Direct labor cost is given $20, $35 and $30. And the hourly rate is also given $25 per hour. So, how many direct labor hours are required per unit? You have to divide 20 divided by 25 for the first product. So, that's the direct labor hours required for service R. And as for service S, for one unit, the direct labor cost is $35. And hourly rate is $25. So, which means that the number of hours taken is 35 divided by 25. And as for service T, the direct labor cost is $30 for one unit. And for each hour, $25 is being paid. So, what is the hours taken for one unit? It is 30 divided by 25. So, we will copy that into the answer as well. Labor hours required per unit, 20 divided by 25 is 0 0.8, 35 divided by 25 is 1.4 and 30 divided by 25 is 1.2. Now, we can very easily calculate contribution per labor hour. So, contribution per labor hour is 50 divided by 0.8, that's 62.5 for R. 65 divided by 1.4, that is $46 for product S. And as for product T, it is 83 divided by 1.2 or $69 per hour for product T. So, whenever there is a single limiting factor, you have to rank the products based on contribution per labor hour and not based on the original contribution. So, the first rank is for product T, which has got 69 per hour. Next in line is product R, which contributes 62.5 per labor hour. So, rank 2 is given to product R and finally product S is given rank 3. So, in the question they have asked which is the most and the least profitable product. So, the most profitable product is T and the least profitable product is product S. So, the right answer is option D. Now, moving to the next question, a linear programming model has the objective function c is equal to 5x plus 6y where c is the contribution x is the number of units of x and y is the number of units of y each unit of x uses 2 kg of material z and each unit of y uses 3 kg of material c the standard cost of material z is dollar 2 per kg so that is the rate at which 
material C is being purchased from the market right now. The shadow price for material C is dollar 2.8 per kg. If an extra 20 kg of material Z becomes available at dollar 2 per kg, that is the existing rate itself, what is the maximum increase in contribution? Now, first of all, you have to understand what do you mean by a shadow price? Shadow price is the maximum premium that can be paid for a scarce resource. Now, if I explain with X, Y and Z, you will get confused. So, we will take a very simple example. Suppose we are into the business of making puddings and cakes. So, X is puddings and Y is cakes. And for both puddings and cakes, we need a raw material and that is eggs. So, let this material Z be eggs. And right now, we are purchasing eggs for dollar 2 per kg. Just assume. That's a raw material. And they are saying that the shadow price of material Z or the shadow price of eggs is dollar 2.8 per kg. What does this mean? It simply means that eggs are scarce. Since the eggs are scarce, we might have to pay a premium for these eggs or premium for the scarce resource. And how do we decide what is the maximum premium that we can pay for these eggs? We immediately link it to the profit, right? Maximum premium that we can pay for these eggs will be linked to the profit that we achieve, right? And what is the profit that we achieve? Profit means basically the additional contribution because fixed cost is constant. That is how we calculate the shadow price. So, shadow price is always equal to the additional contribution generated. Any doubts, you can refer to the video that I have uploaded about shadow price. So, shadow price is always equal to the additional contribution created. In the question, they have said the shadow price of X is dollar 2.8 per kg. So, we know that the maximum premium that we can pay for these X is dollar 2.8 per kg. But in the question, they have said material Z or the X becomes available at dollar 2 per kg. That is, it is available at the very same rate that was existing now. We are not paying any premium, it seems. So, if we are not paying any premium, then whatever additional contribution that is generated will fall in our pocket, right? So, the maximum increase in contribution will be equal to $2.8 per kg. And how many kgs are available? They have said an extra 20 kg is available. The total amount works out to dollar. 56. So, the additional contribution that has been created, that is $1.56 will fall in our pocket itself because we are not paying any additional premium. Earlier, the material C was available at $2 per kg and even now we are paying $2 per kg. So, whatever additional contribution, that's $1.56 will fall in our pocket or that will be the maximum increase in contribution. The right answer is option B. Now, let me ask you a tricky question. If the question was worded differently, Material Z becomes available not at dollar 2 per kg, but if it is mentioned that material Z is available at dollar 3 per kg, then what will be the answer? There you are paying a premium because existing rate was just dollar 2 and we are paying a premium of dollar 1 per kg, which means that you will have to reduce that premium dollar 2.8 minus dollar 1. Whatever premium that has been paid will be gone from our hands and only dollar 1.8 will be the additional contribution created. So, that need be applied only if you are paying a premium. But thankfully, in this question, we are not paying a premium and hence, this entire additional contribution will fall into our pocket. So, I hope it is clear. Moving to question number 28. So, this is a clip from the explainer video of linear programming. Now, what do you mean by ISO contribution line? ISO contribution line shows all combinations of two products that give the same total contribution. So, in this particular case, this yellow line is the ISO contribution line and any combination on the line gives the same contribution. So, the equation of the ISO contribution line is 4x plus 8y is equal to 4000 where the contribution of x is 4 and the contribution of y is 8. So, this point is actually 0, 500, where x is equal to 0 and y is equal to 500. So, if you substitute in this equation 4 into 0, 0 plus 8 into 500, yes, it's 4000. And if you take this point where x is equal to 1000 and y is equal to 0, now if you substitute it in this equation, 
4 into 1000 plus 8 into 0, yes, it adds up to 4000. So whatever point that you take on the ISO contribution line, you get the same contribution. So that is what is mentioned in point number 1. Now what I want to say here is regarding the slant of this ISO contribution line. In this particular case, the contribution of X is just $4. And the contribution of y is $8, which means that y's contribution is greater than the contribution of x. And how is the slope of this ISO contribution line? It is flat. What do you mean by flat? Flat in the sense that look at the distance that it has moved from the origin on the x-axis. It's more. And look at the distance that the ISO contribution line has moved from the y-axis. It is less which means that it is more or less flat. So it is flat simply because the contribution of y is greater than the contribution of x. So we will just make a note of it. If it's a flat curve, it means that the contribution of y is greater than x. This is the example that we saw here. Instead of the ISO contribution line of 4x plus 8y is equal to 4000, say the ISO contribution line is 8x plus 4y is equal to 4000. That is a contribution of x is greater than the contribution of y. Just the reverse of the earlier one. So how would the ISO contribution line appear? It would appear like this. That is 0, 500 and 1000, 0 will just get reversed. Here it is 0, 1000 and here it is 500, 0. Which means that we are getting a steep curve. The earlier one was flat. The second ISO contribution line is a steep curve. And why was it steep? It was steep simply because the contribution of x is greater than the contribution of y. So let's make a note of it. It's a steep curve if the contribution of x is greater than that of y or the contribution of y is less than that of x. Now let's take the next scenario where the contribution of x and y are equal. So how will this equation be? It will be 4x plus 4y is equal to 4000 which means that the contribution of x and the contribution of y will be the same. So we will find out two plots for x and y so that we can draw a straight line. Now when x is equal to 0, so 4 into 0 is equal to 0 and 4y is equal to 4000, so y is equal to 1000. So in this case y is equal to 1000. And in the next case when y is equal to 0, 4 into 0 is equal to 0 and 4x will be equal to 4000, so x is equal to 1000. So the two points of plot for this line is where x is equal to 0, y is equal to 1000 and when y is equal to 0, x is equal to 1000. So 0, 1000 is here and 1000, 0 is here. We join those two points to get the line which represents the equation 4x plus 4y is equal to 4000. This is a line which is neither steep nor flat. Which means that when the contribution of y is equal to x, then we get a moderate curve. So if you notice all the three curves, that's whether it's a flat curve, steep curve or moderate curve, it's all downward sloping. Now what do you mean by a downward sloping curve? It means that, see, when the first point of plot, that is when x is equal to 0, for the first line, y is equal to 500. And then subsequently when x increases, y starts reducing. Likewise, for the second curve also, when x is equal to 0, y is equal to 1000. And when x increases, y starts reducing. And for the third curve, when x is equal to 0, y is equal to 1000. And as we proceed across the x-axis, the value of y reduces. So all these three curves are downward sloping curves. We will look at a scenario where it is an upward sloping curve. So this is the last scenario. This is when one product has got a negative contribution. So negative contribution, we will take the contribution of x is negative 1 and y has got a positive contribution. So we are going to represent this line that is minus 1x plus 4y is equal to 4000 in the graph. We will find out the two plots when x is equal to 0, so minus 1 into 0 plus 4y is equal to 4000. So what is y is equal to? y is equal to 4000 divided by 4 or y is equal to 1000 units. Now we will take another point, say x is equal to 800. We can take any point. 
So if x is equal to 800, then minus 1 into 800 plus 4y is equal to 4000. So we get the answer of y as 1200 units. So the first plot is 0000, which is here. And the second plot, 800, 1200 is here. So we join the line to get the line which represents the equation minus 1x plus 4y is equal to 4000. So in this case, what is happening? From the point of origin, it is moving upwards. So it is an upward sloping curve, which means that if the contribution of one product is negative, then it is an upward sloping curve. All the other curves were downward sloping. So we will write that too. So upward sloping curve is when contribution of y or x is negative. So this is the summary, shape of ISO contribution line, flat curve when the contribution of y is greater than x, steep curve when the contribution of y is less than x, moderate curve when contribution of y is equal to x, and all these are downward sloping curves, and it's an upward sloping curve when the contribution of either y or x is negative. I request you to take a screenshot, and with this information, we will tackle the next question. An organization is experiencing a shortage of resources and has graphed a potential linear programming solution which shows its first product, television, on the horizontal axis. Horizontal axis is nothing but the x-axis and its other product, tablet computers, on the vertical axis. That's nothing but the y-axis. The so television on the x-axis and tablet computer on the y-axis. ISO contribution line to solve the linear program is very flat and downward sloping. Which statement is likely to be true? So we will just copy the information that we have just studied. So it's a flat downward sloping curve when y is greater than x or tablet computers is more than TV. So here the first statement contribution for tablet computers must be higher than that for television. So that's the right answer. All the other three options pertains to the other three scenarios. So let's move on to the next question. Question number 29. A linear programming model has been formulated for two products A and B manufactured by J Company. Which two statements are true? J Company can use linear programming if it starts to manufacture another product C. Now, in a graph, we've got just the x-axis and the y-axis. So basically, we cannot accommodate a third product in linear programming, which means that the first statement is false. J Company would not need to use linear programming if there was not a demand constraint. Now, linear programming is used when there is direct laborers or machinas or direct material constraint. There should definitely be two or more constraints. It should not be a case of a single limiting factor. But it is not necessary that the demand constraint should be included in these two or more constraints. So the second statement is false. Now the third statement, J company should ignore fixed cost when making decisions about how to utilize production capacity in the short run using linear programming. That is true because fixed costs are ignored and calculations are based only on contributions. Whatever decision we take, the fixed costs are remaining constant. So there's no point in considering the fixed cost. So that statement is true. Linear programming models can be used when there is an experience curve once the steady state has been achieved. Now, what do you mean by experience curve? Now, due to experience curve, there is a reduction in cost due to the experience that is gained in production, marketing, etc. So, variable cost will continuously reduce. But on achieving steady state, variable cost will be constant and thereby contribution will also be constant. Now, for any linear programming model, we draw something called the ISO contribution line. We can draw this line only if the contribution is constant. So, that happens only when the steady state has been reached, which means that linear programming models can be used when there is an experience curve once the steady state has been reached is right because only for a steady state, the contribution will be constant. So, statement 4 is right. An organization has the following contribution function. Contribution is equal to 12A plus 8B, where A is the number of units of product A produced and B is the number of units of product B produced. The graph shows that the optimal production plan exists where the following two constraints cross. 
So the optimal production plan is caused by the intersection of these two lines. There's a maximum demand of 10,000 units of each product. How many units of product A are produced in order to maximize the contribution? We have to find out the units of product A produced at the optimum production plan. So all that we have to do is we have to solve these two equations. So I've just jotted down the two equations. Now, in order to solve these two equations and we want to solve for A, which means that we want to knock off B. So for knocking off B, we have to make the coefficient of B same. So here the coefficient is 2. So if we can make the second equation's coefficient of B2, then we can easily subtract and knock off B. So first we will number these equations and we will multiply equation 2 by 2. Why? So as to make the coefficient of B2. So multiplying equation 2 by 2, we get 4A plus 2B is equal to 26,000. We will mark it as equation 3. Now equation 3 minus equation 1 will give you 4A minus A gives 3A, 2B minus 2B that gets knocked off, 26,000 minus 8,000 is equal to 18,000. So what is A equal to? A is equal to 18,000 divided by 3 or 6,000 units. So the right answer is option C. Now moving to the next question, an organization has graphed the following linear programming model. All constraints have less than or equal to constraints. Now, whenever there is a less than or equal to constraint, say this is the first constraint. So in order to arrive at the solution that satisfies this constraint, because it is less than, we have to select a production plan which lies below this line. And as for this constraint, we have to select a production plan which is below this line. And as for the third constraint, we should select a production plan which is below this line simply because it's a less than or equal to constraint. So the common feasible region is this triangle. That is the area which is common to all the three constraints. Now what is the question? What is the maximum number of units of product B which can be produced? So within the feasible region, the number of units of product B which can be produced, uh, the maximum point is 60. So the right answer is 60 units. Now moving to the next question. You are given a linear programming graph in which the feasible region has been given as A, B, C, D. So this is the feasible region A, B, C and D. This is the feasible region. And they have said that the dotted line is the ISO contribution line. So this is the ISO contribution line. And B is the optimum production plan. So this is B. So this is the optimum production plan which has a shadow price. Now, always note that the shadow price means the premium that you pay for a scarce resource. Now, this optimum production plan B is caused by the intersection of which two lines? It is caused by the intersection of the direct labor hours line and also the demand constraint of R, that is R is equal to 500 line. So, B is caused by the intersection of those two lines, which means that direct labor hours is getting fully utilized at the optimum production plan, which means that direct labor is a scarce resource. All the other lines, if you notice here, it is running above the point B. See the material A line is this. Material A line, it's running above the point B. That is, if you see here, there is a gap between the optimum production point B and the constraint of the material A line. The material B constraint line is this. Even that is running above the point B. There's a gap here. Likewise, the next constraint, that's the machine hours constraint, that is also above B. Here also, there is a gap between the production point B and the machine hours line, which means that all these have got surplus resources. It is not completely utilized at the point B. This simply means that material A, material B, machine hours are not scarce. And since these are not scarce, they will not have a shadow price. Items which have a shadow price is the direct labor hours only. Now moving to the next question. Which of the following statements is true of pricing? Discrimination is always illegal, so everyone should pay the same amount. This statement is not true. What do you mean by price discrimination? Charging different prices in different regions. For example, Netflix. 
it charges a different rate in USA and it charges a different rate in India. So price discrimination is never illegal. Early adopters. What do you mean by early adopters? Early adopters are the first customers. Get a discount for being first in the market. This is also not true. Take the case of iPhone. The Apple company charges a heavy premium on the first customers. It is only subsequently that the prices are reduced. So early adopters are not getting a discount just by being first in the market. Now the third statement is pricing against a similar competitor is important in the internet age because in order to face the competition we have to adopt whatever pricing strategy that will defeat our competitor. Price to make the most sales. What is the price to make the most sales? In order to have more sales, we should reduce the selling price. So that will always get the most profits. No, it is not true. Because once you reduce the selling price, our profits will start to drop. So finally, the right statement is only option C. Now moving to the next question. Which of the following conditions would need to be true for a price skimming strategy to be effective? Now, the classic example of a price skimming strategy is the company Apple. Now, whenever a new iPhone model is introduced in the market, they charge a premium and it is only subsequently that its rate gets reduced. Now, the first statement, an existing product where the owners have decided to increase prices. Existing product. Price skimming strategy is always for a new model or a new product. It is never for an existing product which means that this statement is false. Now moving to the next statement where the product has a long life cycle. Products like iPhone always have a short life cycle because they get outdated once a new model is introduced in the market. Statement C where the product has a short life cycle. Yes, that's absolutely true. And the next statement where only modest development costs have been incurred. This is not true because the development cost is very high for products such as the iPhone. So finally, the right statement is only option C. Now moving to the next question, which of the following conditions must be true for a price discrimination strategy to be effective? Now what do you mean by price discrimination? Price discrimination means charging different prices in different regions like Netflix charges a particular rate in USA and it charges a reduced rate in India. So the first statement, buying power of customers must be similar in both market segments. No, this is absolutely not true. The buying power of customers in USA is absolutely different from the buying power of customers in India. It's actually because of the difference in the buying power that they adopt a price discrimination strategy. So statement A is false. Goods must not be able to move freely between the market segments. Must not be able to. That is absolutely true because if the goods are able to move freely from one market segment to the other, then people can buy goods from the lower priced market segment and sell it to the higher priced market segment. The goods must not be able to move freely. So the statement is right. Goods must be able to move freely between market segments. This is exactly the opposite of point B. So this is false. Last statement, the demand curves in each market must be the same. Now in one market, the people may be very sensitive to prices. That is a slight increase in prices, they might react and the sales might drop. And in the other market segment, the people might be insensitive to changes in prices. So the demand curve in each market segment must be the same is never true.